Magic is what the majority of Vanadil's history has revolved around in some capacity, for better or for worse. Magic, as most adventurers know it, can be used to mend damage as much as it can be used to inflict it, with the latter providing a much greater spectacle in most cases. But the nature of magic stretches far beyond these two base schools. When they first discovered magic, the Taru Taru reveled in it, seeing it as an excellent way of overcoming their distinct lack of physical stature that would usually befit a warrior. However, in the same vein that a warrior lacking skill with their weapon limits their potential, the same holds true for magic users who sling spells without a second thought. The ancient Taru Taru could have certainly counted themselves among this crowd, caring only for magic's immediate impact rather than its wider application. There was only one exception to this, and that was Warlock Warlord Lungo Nango. Lungo was a famous, or infamous depending on who you ask, commander of Windurst's armies during the Age of Magic, and it was his incredible innovations that took what was essentially a rabble of spellcasters and turned them into a prolific engine of conquest. Lungo was actually not adept in magic at all, far from it. He was a beastmaster who happened to have a very sharp mind for strategy. From observing magic being used on the battlefield, Lungo was able to formulate methods from proving its application, and the effect these methods had on the success of his army's conquests were profound. <laughs> Following his subjugation of the majority of the Quan continent, Lungo returned to Windus to a hero's welcome, before he was unceremoniously stripped of his command by the Parliament of Patriarchs, which was getting a bit concerned about how efficient he was. Despondent, but not content to let his methods fade away just like he found himself doing, Lungo committed all of his findings to parchment and filed them away. Centuries passed without anyone paying his work the slightest mind until it was found by the unlikeliest person imaginable. A Hume, a painter who had been drafted into the army of the Republic of Bastok as an intelligence officer. The young man's name was Gunther Schultz, and upon reading Lungo's work, he immediately understood the scale of the find he just made. Schultz translated and compiled Lungo's methods, then expanded on them, making additions only where he saw fit. Since each method, new and old alike, had practical application when forming battlefield strategies which revolved around the use of magic, Schultz gave them a new moniker of stratagems. This way, laymen would understand what he was conveying. This hefty tome of compiled stratagems became the first grimoire, an impressive tome Schultz titled Theories of War. Theories of War became the basis for what Schultz coined the martial theory of magic, with its founding principle echoing that of Lungo before him. Put simply, martial theory is one of utility and perseverance over instantaneous but ultimately costly results, Vanadil's equivalent of Fabian tactics. Schultz's grimoire was initially an obscure pursuit for the intelligentsia of the Bastokan elite, something seen as a thought-provoking pastime for military officers. This all changed, however, in 690 CE with the Second Battle of Konstadt. This battle was Schultz's debut as a battlefield commander, and to say he made an impression is a major understatement. Using his stratagems, Schultz and the Bastokan military inflicted a crushing, humiliating defeat on the Royal Army of Sandoria. A defeat so severe it resulted in a civil war and almost obliterated the once proud kingdom in a single battle. Sandoria would never see the heights of power it once did, largely thanks to the brilliance of a painter with an inquisitive mind. Gunther Schultz became a household name in Bastok that day, and his rise to fame brought in prospective students from across the land. His first pupils came from Bastok, but before he knew it, Schultz was teaching curious mages from Windurst, and even despondent outcasts from Sandoria, all eager to learn from the master of martial theory. Schultz's graduates formed a group of military tacticians who would eventually become known as the Scholars. To facilitate the rapid growth in his following, Schultz produced numerous copies of his grimoire and improved it further by imbuing it with magical properties. Schultz engraved each copy of the grimoire with an astral signature, allowing for ease of access through summoning it directly to the scholar's hand whenever they need it, and for the rapid application of its stratagems when casting. 
When taking to the battlefield themselves, scholars are magic users who forsake the parochial scopes of those who utilize single schools of magic, white and black mages especially. Red mages may claim to utilize both schools of magic, but they forego true mastery in favor of swordsmanship. Scholars served with distinction in the Crystal War, using their acumen to formulate battle strategies and command the allied forces to ultimate victory. They were not afraid to jump into the fray themselves either, and the allied forces appreciated their mastery of practical magic as much, if not more than their brilliant plans which saved precious lives in a time of turmoil. Although they were revered during the Crystal War, the scholars abruptly vanished from the annals of history shortly afterward. Neither they, or their signature grimoires could be found anywhere in the years that followed. It remains to this day one of the most bizarre incidents in Vanadil's history. What happened to the scholars? Where did they go? This is where our story begins, when an intrepid adventurer ventures into the past, to the air of the Crystal War, to uncover the truth. The adventurer comes across a scholar shortly after arriving in the Crystal War era and strikes up a conversation. Introducing herself as Professor Erlene, the scholar explains that she is part of the operations staff for the Bastogan contingent of the Allied forces. She also serves as a teacher of martial theory to new aspiring scholars. Noticing that the adventurer is a little bit perplexed, Erlene takes the initiative and demonstrates the dualistic nature of the grimoire, switching between the two schools of magic with ease. Very impressed by this, the adventurer asks to begin their training as a scholar themselves, to which Erlene accepts, taking a liking to their curiosity. After fetching a stack of vellum for the creation of a new grimoire, the adventurer gets their first impromptu lesson from Erlene. Erlene summarizes the distinct advantage in a scholar's martial theory. White and black magic are diametrically opposed, she says, something which forces their practitioners to specialize in their given school. Although a necessity of specialization, it also renders such mages unable to properly respond to sudden changes in the heat of battle. Even the best lay plans can go wrong, but if one is as adaptable as a scholar is, then victory can still be snatched from the jaws of defeat. Erlene concedes that, as good a lecturer as she is, martial theory is best learned as its tenets imply, practically. Before the adventurer can begin their training as a scholar in earnest, they need to attune their grimoire with an astral signature, something which requires what Erlene calls an arcane tap effect, a sustained source of magic power to activate the grimoire. The adventurer uses their manifold ability, and this does the trick. Their grimoire activates and attunes itself to their personal astral signature. After taking a moment to revel in their achievement, the pair are interrupted by another scholar, Professor Albrecht. Albrecht is the chief of operations of the Bastogan military, and a highly decorated scholar in his own right. As the adventurer soon discovers though, Albrecht also has a flair for theatrics, and something of a superiority complex on him. He certainly doesn't make a very good first impression on the adventurer. As Albrecht steps away, he goes into a long-winded spiel on the history and nature of magic, and this is where his flair really shows. He treads on some of the same ground as Erlene, but he comes across as a lot less flattering in his prose. The adventurer notes that it's almost as if viewing two teachers with radically different teaching styles. It is understandable for scholars to be proud of their knowledge and accomplishments, but standing between Albrecht and Erlene, it is clear to the adventurer whose ego is getting in their way. All attention is diverted and Albrecht is cut short by the arrival of a third scholar, Gunther Schultz II. Upon seeing him, the adventurer knows that he must be the direct descendant of the original Gunther Schultz, the hero of the Second Battle of Konstadt, because he lived some 200 years before the current Crystal War. Erlene quietly explains to them that Schultz has not only inherited his famous grandfather's titles and legacy, but he has also proven himself equal to them. In sharp contrast, Schultz makes a very good impression on the adventurer. He clearly has a brilliant mind, but he is also humble, regardless of the high regard people hold him in, caring very little for his titles and not letting his ego get in his way. Schultz is the ideal professor, an impressive academic whose experiences have made him open to the world, knowing full well that his learning alone does not elevate him above others. 
Schultz gives much wanted encouragement to the aspiring scholar before departing for his next duty. The adventurer's first encounter with the scholars has been interesting. A few months later and the adventurer has had ample time to familiarize themselves with the grimoire. They return to Professor Erlene for an evaluation, but when they arrive, they find her clearly troubled. Erlene explains that neither her nor her colleagues have been able to contact Professor Schultz. Searches in each of the Allied Nations have proved fruitless, and the Professor's absence from the last conference at the Scholars has gotten Erlene more than a bit concerned. Worried that he has gotten himself into trouble behind enemy lines, Erlene asks the adventurer to try and track down the Professor, to which they accept. They are still seeking an evaluation after all. Before they can depart, they are stopped by Albrecht, who gives the adventurer a sealed letter to give to Schultz in the event they find him. The thought of telling Albrecht to find Schultz himself does cross the adventurer's mind, but Sena has prevailed. They don't want to clash with a senior figure. Finding the professor takes a very long time. He's certainly adept at covering his tracks. What gives Schultz away is him leaving a trace of a storm spell, which the adventurer's grimoire resonated with. All magic leaves a trace of being cast, and spell scholars create are no exception to this. Storm spells have a distinct signature for those familiar with them. So whether from a scroll like a mage, or from a schema like a scholar, no magic is foolproof. As it turns out, Schultz was indeed gathering intel from the heart of Quadav territory. Specifically, he was investigating rumors that the Beastman forces have begun employing strategists of their own. It pains him to admit it, but Schultz confesses that he was discovered by a patrol of Quadav shield warriors and was forced to hide, using magic to conceal his presence. He's simply been waiting for the enemy to disperse before he can leave his hiding place and get back behind allied lines. Remembering that they're carrying a letter meant for him, the adventurer gives Schultz Ulbrecht's letter. Schultz says nothing while he reads Ulbrecht's letter, clearly deep in contemplation. When done, he turns to the adventurer and asks that they tell Erlene that all is well, and that he will return in due course, as soon as his circumstances change for the better. He also gives them a written letter of his own, a reply to Ulbrecht, Schultz says that he has encoded his location in the letter should Albrecht want to pursue this further, expertly reading between the lines and discerning that the adventurer is already unhappy about having to run an errand for Albrecht he could have feasibly done himself. Erlene is relieved to hear that Schultz is alive and well, but before she can ask anything other specifics, Albrecht's impeccable timing strikes again and he interrupts the conversation again. Ulbrecht reveals that his letter contained his ruminations on the development of the Allied forces, which certainly explains why he had to magically seal the letter so only Schultz himself could open it. He asks if Schultz had any feedback on the matter. The adventurer, mirroring Ulbrecht's aloof manner earlier on, just gives him the letter Schultz wrote. Saying that he will go to the professor and help him to safety, Ulbrecht moves to leave, but Aline finally snaps at him. She chastises Ulbricht on his distinct lack of tact when addressing aspiring scholars, also for his indignation and presumptuousness that students will simply do anything he tells them to without recognition or reward for their time. Finally showing a measure of humility, Ulbricht concedes that he has acted out of line and gives the adventurer a form schema. A few more months pass and the adventurer, now close to being a fully accomplished scholar, comes back to Erlene for another evaluation. Their hopes are again dashed though, there is something very urgent that needs addressing before any diplomas can be given out. Erlene takes them out of earshot of anyone who might be listening and gets them up to speed. Majors have been disappearing from the ranks of the allied forces since a few weeks ago. If mages had been falling on the battlefield, it would not be a cause for concern, but the fact that they have been vanishing from the main cities, the encampments, and field bases has the scholars at a loss for an explanation. The first thought Erlene and her fellow officers had is that it could be attributed to a sudden spate of desertions, but there's still too many cases with no rationale behind them to prove such a theory. 
That the Allied forces are still in their infancy and lacking a concrete and secure method of communication between them compounds this problem further. To this end, the Allies have decided that the scholars, with their established ties to one another through academia, are the right people to tackle the situation. Erlene tells the adventurer that the regional commanders are all gathering in Sandoria to discuss their preliminary findings, and that she would ask them to attend the council in her stead. Arriving in Sandoria, the adventurer sees a group of four scholars, including Ulbrecht, seemingly waiting for their arrival. Ulbrecht, still unable to remember the adventurer's name for some reason, calls them over so they can begin the meeting. The three other scholars, Machaduyux, Lena, and Nalkuku, all say that this is an act Ulbrecht is putting on. They all seem to be on good terms with him, despite his often aloof attitude. All present notice that Fen, the second attaché the scholars have to Windurst, is absent, but they have to begin the meeting regardless. Ulbrecht gets the group up to speed with ongoing events. Intelligence reports from the security forces indicate that the Beastmen have indeed adjusted their strategy as of late to specifically target the scholars. It seems that the Beastmen have suffered too many defeats due to the superior tactics of the Allied forces, so rather than rush into another ill-fated battle, they have instead opted to even the odds by eliminating the officer corps of the scholars. The scholars have gathered here in Sandoria in an attempt to brainstorm and hopefully identify the means the beastmen are going about this recent spree of kidnappings and assassinations. Tomberry assassins were commonly employed by the beastmen in the Crystal War, but even they left telltale signs of their deeds whenever they operated. This is something else, a new strategy that needs a counter quickly. The conversation inevitably turns to Fen, as the scholars need her input to come to a more concise conclusion. The council is adjourned and all present are directed to the Aragon U region to begin the search for her. The scholars are all waiting for the adventurer by the time they arrive in the Saramute Champagne. Machaduex has already gone ahead on Chocobo to ask the local sentries if they have seen Fen. Returning to the group, Machaduex gives his report. Fen was seen by the sentries entering the area, but she was not seen leaving it, meaning she must still be in the vicinity somewhere. The region is held by the Allied forces, so there should not have been too many beastmen around to potentially abscond with Fen. Even then, she would have been able to handle a few beastmen, being an accomplished scholar. Nalkuku jumps ahead and suggests that the scholars split up to locate Fen quicker, but this irks Machaduux, who accuses her of wanting all the credit for herself. Nalkuku retorts with a very thinly veiled threat, and the two glare daggers at each other. Clearly this is a common occurrence between the two, as neither Lena or Ulbrecht are surprised in the slightest. Lena asks the adventurer to break them up, but Ulbrecht rightfully stands them both down, demonstrating a surprising degree of personal tact in defusing a potentially volatile situation. Figuring time apart will best cool them down, Ulbrecht sends the two on their way, before having Lena and the adventurer search where they are not. A ways down the road, the adventurer finds something that looks strangely familiar, a symbol that resembles the storm signature Schultz left behind in the Paschal Marshlands. The adventurer doesn't see any of his fellow scholars around, so he cautiously approaches. The symbol likewise reacts to their grimoire, and suddenly turns into a transportation crest. Before they can even react, the adventurers whisked away to places unknown. Materialising in a spacious cavern, the adventurer is called over by Ulbrecht. It seems that the scholars were all transported here, wherever here is. Walking over, the adventurer sees Machadukes dead on the floor. The beastmen have been trapping scholars here and killing them in isolation, apparently. As Ulbrecht explains his findings, though, a sudden chill creeps up the adventurer's spine. Something is not right here, the intuition is going haywire. Then, they see it too late. Ulbrecht invokes another, completely foreign stratagem and freezes the adventurer to the spot, unable to move. With a maniacal look in his eyes, Ulbrecht reveals the truth. He had made a very sinister discovery when experimenting on his grimoire. He found that its power, and subsequently his own magic, could be amplified by using the blood of magic users when writing new pages in it. 
At first, he limited himself to the mages among the beastmen. When that did not work, he tried the blood of warriors. When that likewise did not work, he finally made his breakthrough. While assisting at an allied infirmary, he pressed his grimoire to the wounds of a mage in an attempt to stem the blood flow, and his grimoire sapped the mage dry. The magic power and knowledge of the mage had been drained into the grimoire itself. Since then, Ulbricht has been murdering his colleagues by the droves, seeding false reports of beastmen scholars to throw off his trail. Even if they were not frozen by magic, the adventurer would have been frozen with fear at these revelations. They never got along well with Albrecht, but they could have never anticipated this from him. He draws his knife and prepares to finish the adventurer off. In desperation, they try to cast a spell to break free, but nothing comes. Then, as Albrecht lunges, a white magic crest appears and repels him backwards. Seeing that the spell he put on the adventurer is fading, Albrecht decides to disengage and he flees with a warp spell. Free of Albrecht's spell, the adventurer picks up his mortarboard and rushes back to inform Erlene. Their face alone tells Erlene that something has gone very wrong. Figuring it's best to let her know sooner rather than later, the adventurer relays the horrific truth. All the scholars that made up the multinational council are dead killed by one of their own for their power. They give Albrecht's mortal board to Erlene and tell her that he is the culprit behind the disappearance of the mages and scholars from the allied forces. Distraught and shaken to a core, Erlene tries to gather herself, but they are both interrupted by the arrival of a contingent from the Duchy of Juno. At the request of Nagmolada, Erlene has been summoned to the central command of the allied forces, likely to give an update on the investigation. Erlene tells the adventurer how to attain a scholar's attire to signify their progress. With their ranks severely depleted, they need all the help they can get right now. A few days later, the new scholar comes to Erlene for an update. Her news is grave. Upon hearing what has become of Albrecht, control over the investigation has been taken away from the scholars and put solely in the hands of the Duchy of Juno. Furthermore, Nagmalada made no illusions as to what he thought of the scholars deeming them a necessary evil that had no place in the Alliance once the war had been won. Albrecht's actions have caused too much damage to the Allied forces, and if that morbid desire for power exists in one scholar, it can exist in others just as easily. Still, Erlene is determined to set things right. The remaining scholars need to track down Albrecht and put an end to him. To do this, they need to find Schultz again. Albrecht's killing spree only started shortly after he received that sealed letter from Schultz, so it stands to reason that even if Schultz does not know where Albrecht is, he'll certainly know how to find him. The scholar returns to the same location they found Schultz in the Paschal Marshlands, only to find him to not be there, but he has left behind another sealed letter, this time to the scholar themselves. Returning to Erlene, they both read the letter together. It is indeed from Schultz and its contents are harrowing. Only when nourished and bathed in deep crimson depths of the most magic bloods shall the true tome of stratagems be born. And that which riseth forth will come to be feared by all, bloodseed grimoire. Yet if left besmirched by the coursing magics of this profane world, all will be in vain. Such blood when commanded to script will serve naught but to soak the page, running into incomprehensibility. Recourse for those who seek absolution is limited to a single path. The purging must take place where banishing stones form and fountainheads spew forth. Olbrecht is attempting to purify the Bloodseed Grimoire to achieve transcendent magic power through its countless blood sacrifices. This begs another major question, one that the scholar is glad Erlene raises, because the thought of it is too horrifying to consider themselves. This letter was written by Schultz, that much is certain, but is this the same letter he wrote to Albrecht all those months ago? Where did Albrecht even get the Bloodseed Grimoire? Did he get it from Schultz? He did invite Albrecht to come to him in person after all, far away from prying eyes. Is Schultz in league with Albrecht? If so, why? 
There are so many questions going through both the scholars' minds, but they cannot afford to indulge them. They need to find Albrecht, now. Fortunately, Schultz seems to have left a clue in his letter when he refers to banishing stones. Erlene says that she once received a pair of silver earrings as a gift from Albrecht, and at the same time he told her that silver has mystical properties which ward against evil. That cannot be a coincidence. There's only one place in the entire Quan continent where silver and water springs can be found in abundance. The resort silver mines beneath Grauberg. Albrecht is there. He has to be. Erlene notices that Schultz has also embedded an extremely complex stratagem for passage into the silver mines. Essential considering the physical entrances were all caved in during the Battle of Grauberg. Now armed with a plan, the two scholars split up. Erlene will rush to the Allied Central Command to request reinforcements from the Duchy, while the adventurer goes on ahead to confront Albrecht. The scholar combs the Grauberg mountain range and eventually finds the entrance Schultz indicated. Schultz's stratagem works and they are transported within the silver mines, and sure enough, right there is Albrecht. Displaying his typical nonchalant attitude, Albrecht dismisses them, fanatically focused on his morbid creation. The scholar draws their staff and prepares for the impending battle as Albrecht rises to his feet, turning to them with the eerily familiar maniacal look in his eyes. Albrecht has not yet finished the Blood Sea Grimoire, and this time the scholar is prepared for him. Albrecht draws his knife and battle commences. Defeated after a pitch battle between them, Albrecht summons the Blood Sea Grimoire to his hand and prepares to use its power to crush the scholar, using the magical power of all those he has sacrificed to its many pages. Bracing themselves for the onslaught to come, the scholar stares Albrecht down, but before he can complete any incantation, a pool of magic blood appears beneath him and starts dragging him under. Albrecht is completely petrified. He has no idea what is going on. Neither does the scholar. Then, a familiar voice echoes around the cavern. Schultz has materialized out of nowhere. He approaches Albrecht and tells him the circumstances behind his downfall. The Bloodsea Grimoire indeed turned on Albrecht of its own accord, doing so because he was undeserving of the power and knowledge it contained. Schultz explains that the pillar of the scholar's power is to know themselves and know their limits. Omniscient knowledge and power means that there is no more room for development, for growth, and thus no reason to exist. The Grimoire noticed that this was Albrecht's plan for it, so it cast him down. The Grimoire consumes Albrecht whole by dragging him into its crimson depths, fulfilling his twisted desire by becoming part of its being himself. With a resounding thud, the Blood Sea Grimoire slams shut. It falls to the floor, and the torrent of magic power surrounding it subsides. Charles walks over to the fallen tome, and something the scholar then sees causes them to draw their staff again. The crimson red color of the grimoire changes to a pearly white, as a dark shadow emerges from its cover. Charles begins talking to the shadow now beneath his feet, and to the scholar's horror, the shadow talks back. Charles calls the shadow Bifrens. Bifrens? That name, that's familiar for some reason. Where has the scholar heard it before? Then, it hits them with the force of a charging Marid. Bifrens is the head strategist for the Beastman forces, the closest thing the demon kindred have to a military scholar in their own right. Now the scholar remembers where they have seen Bifrens, during the assault on Castle's Val. Bifrens was able to discern the Allied forces' main attack on the castle was a diversion, and he outflanked their scholars despite their best efforts. Schultz was not in league with Albrecht, but he is in league with a kindred. There is no other possible explanation. It all makes sense now. Schultz lied when he said he had been trapped in the Pashal marshlands. He was not hiding from the Quadav, he was liaising with Bifrens. Bifrens must be the creator of the Bloodsea Grimoire. Their mind racing at this revelation, the scholar realizes that this is exactly why the Grimoire would not respond to Albrecht when he tried feeding it the blood of the beastmen. It wouldn't because it was created by the commander of their armies, and he would not want his own creation to be used against them. The Grimoire itself is a trap. 
a trap designed to lure scholars with weak hearts and satiate their desire for knowledge and power. Bifrens is evidently extremely sharp. He knew that the scholars could defeat him and win the Crystal War due to their sheer numbers over himself. So rather than invest in a costly strategy of targeting them directly, he took the more efficient route of turning one of their own against them all, driven by their mortal weakness. He's used Schultz's own philosophy against him. This does not explain their connection though. Why has such a revered scholar dishonored the name of his family and fallen in league with the Dark Kindred? Before they can demand an answer from Schultz, he makes to leave. His parting words to them stop them in their tracks. He implies that he knows that they have come from twenty years in the future. May the goddess cause our paths to cross again in a few years, or a few tens of years. Before they can leave, the ducal guards charge into the cavern, the reinforcements Erlene went to fetch, accompanied by Nagmalada. Two of the guards charge past the scholar and run to the two bodies behind him, bodies which had not been there a few seconds ago. Nagmalada identifies the two as Albrecht Siegt and Gunther Schultz II. The bodies show no sign of open wounds, leading the party to suspect enfeebling magic to be the cause of death. Nagmalada points out the pearly white grimoire, which until a few seconds ago had been in Schultz's hand. He forbids any soldier to touch it and declares that it will be sealed away, clearly suspecting it of having played a major part in the events of the last few months. Nagmalada informs the scholar that Erlene has been released from custody and that they should also leave the crime scene immediately. Their mind racing yet again, they are all too happy to oblige him. Erlene is despondent when they return. The Allied forces are covering up Albrecht's deeds as a mass desertion, and to make matters even worse, after the war is over, the Green Wire is set to be outlawed by all three of the Allied nations, effectively bringing an end to the scholars. Knowing that this is probably going to be their last meeting, Erlene informs the scholar that they are the last graduate of the Schultz School of Martial Theory, giving them their signature mortarboard. They both resolve to see the Crystal War to its end, and whatever comes after, will be. Following the Crystal War, the Scholar returns to the present and immediately makes for Zarkabad, their reasoning being that they can interrogate Bifrens as to what happened. Midway through their trek, a voice stops them. It is Schultz. Knowing what they now know about their former mentor, the Scholar prepares for a fight. Everything about this is wrong. Schultz has not aged a day since they last met, in what would have been twenty years ago in his time. Also, the blood sea grimoire in his hands, it is a pearly white, and Bifrens is nowhere to be seen. Schultz tells the scholar that the time has come for their final test, a test to see whether they are worthy of carrying the legacy of the Schultz school into the future. He requests that they meet him in the castle's vile throne room, his intention clear to them. Walking into the throne room, the scholar finds Schultz sitting on the steps leading to the throne. The blood seat grimoire in his hands now an ominous and very familiar crimson. Bifrens must have rejoined with a grimoire in anticipation of the battle to come. The scholar still has so many questions to ask, but considering the situation they find themselves in, common sense dictates that they are going to have to best Schultz before he will consider divulging his secrets to them. Schultz stands and tells the scholar to show them what they have learned for it is now time for the ultimate test of their abilities. Besting Schultz also dispels Bifrens from the grimoire, and it returns to its original colour. Schultz compliments the scholar on their skills and knowledge, acknowledging them as a suitable successor to his legacy. The burning questions remain, and upon being demanded answers, Schultz finally reveals everything. The man the scholar sees before them is not alive, and has not been alive for over 200 years. This is not Gunther Schultz II, this is the original Gunther Schultz himself. He passed himself off as his own descendant for all this time, using his incredible magic to keep the illusion alive. Schultz explains that after the Second Battle of Konstadt, during his rise to fame, he was afflicted by a terminal illness. As he found himself laying on his deathbed, his mind was only racked with regret. He had so much in his mind, 
New strategies, weapons not taken beyond the blueprint stage, new magics he was on the verge of discovering, it would all die with him. It was then that Schultz was visited by Count Bifferens, who told the dying man that he was impressed with his tactical prowess, and not wanting to see someone like him unceremoniously fade away, much like Lungo Nango before him, offered him an escape. Bifferens would cure Schultz's affliction by infusing the essence of a demon into his body, rendering him immortal. Here began the historic rivalry between Gunther Schultz and Count Bifferens, two immortal beings of great intellect who use Vanadil as their chessboard. Every single conflict in the world, whether in the Middlelands, Artagan or Adeline, in the past 200 years has had these two on opposing sides, influencing the outcome of the war and trying to outdo each other in a never-ending game of intellect. Schultz concedes that Bifferens won their last contest in the Crystal War. Although the Allied forces were ultimately victorious, Schultz suffered a personal defeat. The scholar, wondering what he means, is asked by Schultz if they know what happened to the scholars following the war. With a heavy heart, Schultz explains that the outlawing of the grimoire was only the first step. What came after was a period of persecution, as books were burned, scholars were incarcerated on trumped up charges only to die in prison, and the few that managed to escape overseas were hunted down by bounty hunters. Although the air of persecution subsided, the damage had been done. The scholars were all dead, and the grimoire had been consigned to the bonfire of history. The great mystery had been solved at last. The person standing before Schultz is the sole surviving scholar. But Schultz is pleased by the outcome regardless. He admits that the adventurer who became a scholar out of curiosity reminds him a lot of himself. As such, he cautions them to not go down the same path he chose, for they now bear the task of rebuilding faith in the scholars from the ground up. Schultz bestows the title of Herald of the Grimoire on the scholar, and speculates that a time may come when the scholars will be again needed by Van Adeel. But if that day comes, there is no telling whether they will meet again as colleagues, or as rivals. Armed with the knowledge of martial theory, the scholar ponders their next move. Taking heed of Schultz's lesson on the fate of the scholars, they decide that the best place to rebuild the grimoire's following is overseas, to the west, where great libraries can be found and people eager to learn converge. The scholar also fashions a new garb for the new order of scholars, feeling that the old one carries too many bad connotations. Schultz has set the scholar a major task in rebuilding the following and reputation of the scholars, but in doing so, he marked them as his intellectual equal, therefore equal to the task. Looking around at the towering bookcases, the scholar smiles as they remember the principle of their school, to know is to act. <laughs>